Um, so today I, I would like to talk about a topic that has been wrecking my brains for the last eight years. And six years ago in 2015, I started to um, work on this topic in a more academic manner. Um, and the basic research question is, what does Goethe's Werther mean when the book is read in, for example, Shanghai 1922? So in criticism, we usually have a very convenient way to how to call this kind of phenomenon. Uh, we call it a misunderstanding. So um, readers in China 1922 may actually read it, may appreciate it, but for the wrong reasons, because they don't have access to the sources. They don't know the, they cannot place Werther within the collected works of Goethe, um, within the, German literary scene at the time, the European um, literary scene at the time. So it, it's, it's nice that they read Werther, um, but um, that it doesn't follow that um, there's any value in it. It's misunderstanding. But of course, in terms of epistemology, um, misunderstanding today seems like a convenient shortcut to get rid of a couple of methodological problems um, in a convenient way. So I'll give a brief overview of my talk. Um, I will first discuss how Werther is seen in contemporary criticism. Um, then I will move on to two unorthodox interpretations of Werther. The first one spans very diverse audiences from 1920s Germany to 1920s China to 1940s Japan. Um, and then as a third perspective, um, as, as the other alternative perspective on Werther, I'll um, give a brief summary of the Marxist interpretations of Werther. In the final part, I will try to make sense of the antagonisms that play out between these um, different um, approaches to reading Werther. I have a PowerPoint presentation, but I will only, um, it will only cover the middle part. And you, I, I, I always struggle with um, measuring the time my talks actually um, last. Um, it, it's going to be 50 to 60 minutes maximum. So with regard to the title of my talk, I had second thoughts. I actually thought to give it a more provocative ring, I should have called it the global sorrows of Werther or the virtues of cultural appropriation. Commonly, cultural appropriation is a term that is understood to signify instances of everyday racism. For example, when white people on certain holidays paint their faces black in order to look black. In the realm of literature, however, cultural um, appropriation means something else. Um, it, it designates an instance when Western scholars uh, translate and curate former um, foreign, uh, foreign literature in a way that disfigures the original, disfigures, misunderstand. So we are here in, um, in, in the old, um, in, 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 in familiar territory. Once the direction of cultural appropriation or the cultural encounter to term it more neutrally, um, once this direction changes, the situation is freed from the post-colonial um, sensibility. It is certainly a form of cultural appropriation when a French writer writing in the 1900, 1900s and dresses up his sexual fantasies in an oriental dress. But how about a Persian writer who dresses up his sexual fantasies in a French Rococo setting? In my talk, I will, I will focus on such reversals of cultural appropriation. Arguably, Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther is a text that only started in German language, but became a globally traded commodity. The, no the novel was first published in 1774, 
was translated into French as early as two years later, then into English for five years later, and then in into, in, into Italian in 1782. For the first time, and perhaps for the last time, a German text circulated in multiple, multiple translations in other European languages within just a few decades. Until 1806, six additional translations appeared in English and six into um, French. In the Far East, the text reception commenced a century later. In 1890, Nakai Kinjo translated fragments of Werther into Japanese. In 1936, 11 full translations had appeared. In China, the situation is similar. In 1902, there's um, the first translation of fragments. Um, and then 20 years later, there's in 1922, Guomor, Guomoro, um, the great poet, translates his, publishes his, his, his first full translation. Um, and until 1940, um, four alternative translations appear. So the number of translation is really astounding. If Werther was so successful, um, what is the novel about? An extremely brief summary could read, Werther falls in love with Lotte. She's engaged to another man. In the end, Werther commits suicide. The plot is told in Werther's own words, with the exception of the final part where an editor steps in. I should add that plot summaries are the worst possible way to discuss works of literature. We'll get back to this. But let's start here regardless. Werther falls in love with Lotte, she's married, he commits suicide. In our age, in which casual dating has become the norm, the reading public is bound to find Werther's laments somewhat exasperating. The tragic conclusion seems to be over the top. Recently, I checked for non-academic summaries or reviews of Werther, and I found an excellent one on goodreads.com. And a, this book reviewer sums up her perception with the following um, statement, I quote, a lot of classic novels contain certain things that make us cringe a little today. But The Sorrows of Werther is one that more than most really hasn't aged well. I do not know if some people consider this tragically romantic, but it is not my idea of romance. Werther is a serious pest and a borderline stalker. He needs to let it go, end of quote. The author is right. The text doesn't easily translate into our current world. Recently, I emailed with a friend and I told him that I'll be giving a talk on Werther and he replied, I quote, Obviously, Werther is an allegory of, uh, for Goethe's struggle with repressed homosexuality, end of quote. That is highly speculative, I'd say, but it helps make a sense of one of Werther's most irritating features. He never really makes any advances to Lotte. There is a lot of feeling in this novel, but no action. In scholarly criticism, one can find a very similar kind of Werther fatigue. The text is regarded as over-researched. Writing in 1997, the late Gerd Mattenklot sums up, I quote, every new generation of Werther readers claims to make new or discreet discoveries of obscure references, Compusis compositional devices, or quotes. Time and again, critics readdress the rela relationship between the literary material and its aesthetics. Martin Klott regards further interpretation as pointless. Werther is a problem that was solved long ago. And in a way, I would say, approaching it from this perspective, um, Werther was a is a text that was solved actually 200 years ago already. Goethe presented his seminal self-interpretation in his autobiography, Poetry and Truth, Dichtung und Wahrheit. 
reflecting on a troubled period of, of his life. Um, he thinks, he recalls the moment when he thought about the best way, how, how he can take his own life. And eventually he found that um, a, a historical notice on Otto, the Roman emperor, who pierced his chest with a dagger and, um, and that struck him as particularly heroic. Realizing that he was incapable of doing so, Goethe's mood underwent a gradual transformation. The autobiographic subject explains, I quote, since I never could succeed in this, so piercing my chest with a dagger, I at last laughed myself out of the notion, threw off all hypochondriacal fancies and resolved to live, end of quote. This is a quite dated translation from, by John Oxenford. This impressive gesture of self-assertion represents quite the antithesis um, of how Werther handles his sorrows. Given to self-pity, he's haunted by indecision until he finally kills himself. Goethe, however, overcomes these troubles and wakes up the next morning ready to take on the world. So this is the Goethe myth in a way. According to Goethe's account, the composition of the epistolary novel was therapeutic and helped to keep his suicidal impulses in check. This account presents the genealogy of Werther as a comparably rational process. At no point the despair of the suffering individual shines through. According to Goethe's analysis, Werther is a novel written about a, an unhinged young man but written by another young man, Goethe himself, a young man who wasn't unhinged at all, but in fact very much in control of his emotions. Arguably, Poetry and Truth, Goethe's autobiography, helped bury the text under the weight of this narrative of self-conquest and renunciation. So we all know how much Goethe hated being identified with Werther. So when he traveled to Italy, he very soon adopted an incognito name so that nobody approaches him and says like, oh, you are the, you must be the author of Werther. You have so many feelings. Consequently, the text lost its autonom autonomous status as irony was regarded as the fundamental gesture of the text. The protagonist represents a person who falls short of a norm. And this norm is represented by the author or in more abstract, abstract terms, the text itself. This self-interpretation was gladly taken up by the nascent field of literary criticism in 19th century Germany. Um, its proponents had very little use or for, for Werther's gloomy musings, um, their main aim was to elevate Goethe into the status of a national cultural icon. So here with Werther, we have an instance where a novel becomes, um, is, is reassessed as a minor novel, despite its great success. Um, it's a novel that only inaugurates um, Goethe's literary career that allows him to become a, the beacon of German classicism. Up until today, the disjunction between protagonist and the text's true perspective is really challenged. Naturally, Goethe's biographers is, oh, I, I completely misread this line. Up until today, the disjunction between the protagonist and the author is rarely challenged, of course. Naturally, Goethe, Goethe's biographers celebrate the author who survived an existential crisis and contrast him with the silly protagonist. Even Hans Robert Jaus, one of the great critics of German hermeneutics, agrees with the biographers in a way when he maintains that the text was misunderstood by its in, in, initial audience. So we all know that the text was 
warmly received by an audience that saw to that, that elevated Werther into a hero. So this very early audience of Werther. And Jaus argues, no, they completely misread it because Werther is actually a text about literary autonomy. And they took it too personal. They, they read it as if it were um, um, a Rousseauian novel with a moral content. Surprisingly, the early Friedrich Kittler also endorsed the view that a view that regards Werther as a deficient man. But Kittler being Kittler, he does not invoke aesthetic concerns to make his point, but he suggests that Werther's habit of masturbation makes him appear ridiculous, at least in the eyes of Albert, Lotte's husband. So he's got this very strange idea of Albert laughing at Werther who masturbates while he actually is the husband of Lotte. Alongside Jaust and Kittler, I could enumerate scores of Werther interpretations that build on the assumption that um, Werther is a pathological person. Readers are not supposed to identify with him, but to observe, but they should observe his mistakes from a detached perspective. Broached from this angle, Werther is an unmistakably educational text. In German-speaking countries, Werther is indeed taught at sec secondary school. And as, a, as I browsed a school book, a, a workbook recently, I found that um, students are actually encouraged to think of alternative endings of Werther. So what if Werther had calmed down and went for a drink with the boys instead? What if he had eloped with Lotte? Today, it seems that everybody is smarter than Werther because you, everybody is smarter than Werther who was an idiot for killing himself. Methodologically, this is quite remarkable. I don't recall anyone having ever suggested that a comparable literary figure um, should have acted differently. So, has anyone ever suggested that Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov should actually have refrained from killing the old lady um, on the top floor? Um, how about um, Madame Bovary? Has anyone ever suggested she should buy less glamorous clothes? I, I don't know. Um, let's apply it to, to Nabokov's Lolita. Has anyone suggested that Humpert Humpert should actually have? Um, taken Lolita to the orphanage instead of taking her to this infamous road trip. In the world of Goethe studies, however, it appears perfectly sensible to say that Werther should have pulled himself together. Possibly the emphatic disjunction between Werther and Goethe highlights that we are currently experiencing what Umberto Eco calls the loss of congeniality between a work and its intended audience. There is no denying that contemporary sensibilities do not correspond to Werther. Consequently, the book has ceased to speak to us and is only of muse museal interest. It is part of a literary heritage that, if we only were more honest, no longer speaks to us. And here I would like to start my presentation. All right. Whoops. So I would like to show you one image that tells a very different story of Werther. This bronze sculpture shows Werther kneeling in front of his beloved Lotte. It was erected only a few years ago, and it stands in Seoul, North Korea, uh, South Korea. It is part of an ensemble that belongs to the company headquarters of Lotte, a Korean conglomerate that not only sells biscuits and soda, but also operates huge um, shopping malls. Today, Lotte is the fifth largest company of Korea. Established in, 19, in the 1940s, the founder of Lotte was actually very enthusiastic about Werther and chose to name the company after Lotte, 
the love interest of Werther. So let me share a quick anecdote how I actually um, came across this um, strange um, genealogy of, 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 of Werther in, in Korea. Um, I was working at the Goethe House in Weimar. I ju just started and the director heard that I'm interested in Chinese literature and he said, oh, it was very strange. Last week we had a Korean trade delegation here at the Goethe House and they made a very silly request. They wanted to see a Werther statue. And we said like, no, we've got plenty of Goethe statues, but no Werther statue, why, why, why would you? After all, Goethe is the cultural icon and not, not Werther. And uh, upon hearing this, the Korean trade delegation lost interest. But this photo shows that um, a couple of years later, they had finally, uh, well, they, they didn't find a model, but had a bronze cast made um, in, to honor um, their, 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 um, their founder um, with this statue of Lotte. I, I actually think this is a very, um, it's this bad quality um, brass cast here. Um, I found a much more interesting image. Um, this is again a statue of Lotte in the Lotte headquarters here on this corner. And I really love this image. It's very, very neon. Um, it's very postmodern. It's as if Werther had traveled to, to Las Vegas. Um, unfortunately, I have no, I could find no information about what specific aspect of Werther attracted the founder of Lotte. There is no information. Um, I, I browsed through um, abstracts in Korean papers that are in English and I couldn't find anyone who actually did research on this. So I suppose I'll have to read, um, learn to read Korean. So here at this point, I would like to start unraveling the complex, complex network of connotation that surrounds Goethe's Werther. While 90 or 95% of, of the work's scholarly reception adopts an ironic perspective, Historically, material shows that selected readers have also regarded Werther as a positive hero. I am not talking about the Werther fever um, upon publication, when the book became part of a literary fashion that started in, in English, that started with English sentimentalism, um, but I limit my an analysis to the world of letters. So criticism, um, translations, and authors who penned their own Vertarian novels. I will briefly browse through two alternative approaches, Werther's quest for transcendence, and second, his rebellion um, against an unjust feudal society. I will commence with um, Werther's transcendence. In the letter dating from August 18th, um, he recapitulates how his idea of nature has changed. Right at the beginning of the novel, um, he immersed himself in nature and was all full of joy, etc. And now this um, image has flipped. It is as if a curtain had been drawn from before my eyes and instead of prospects of eternal life, the abyss of an ever open grave yawned before me. Can we say of anything that it is when all passes away when time with the speed of a storm carries all things onward and our transitory existence hurried along by the torrent is swallowed up by the waves or dashed against the rocks. My heart is wasted by the thought of that destructive power which lies latent in every part of the universe, universal nature. Nature has formed nothing that does not destroy itself and everything near it. I am aware that it is a sacrilege to quote Goethe without providing the German original, um, but this is the uh, brilliant translation by Victor Lange, and we're talking about texts and translation, so I hope this should be, should be all right. Conventional scholarship usually refers to this quote, um, this letter, in order to elaborate on Werther's habit of projecting his own feelings um, on the external realm. 
In the first half of the 20th century, however, this passage was also taken at face value. Here, Werther's portrait of a cruel world is understood as a valid observation. In a way, this passage pursues an almost Schopenhauerian perspective on creation. Here, the world is ruled by the will to live, a will to live that is quite blind and void of any hope for salvation. Writing in the 1920s, um, Hermann August Korf indeed elaborated on this perspective and presented one of the most affirmative accounts on Werther ever written in the German language. Korf regards the novel as a tragic love story, but not between Werther and Lotte, but between God and his creation. The protagonist despairs of his miserable existence that cannot satisfy his demands. As a brother in spirit of Faust, Werther seeks to go beyond the boundaries of earthly misery, not through witchcraft, but by exploring his inner divinity, as Korov calls it. Korov's um, somewhat overblown, somewhat overblown analysis reads, in Werther the poet anticipates what Kant, the philosopher, should explore in its full transcendental truth. The subject's world-creating faculty. What is the world? The world is my own perception. In contrast to Faust, however, Werther saves himself from disappointment. The second quote here is, the relationship between the soulful individual and the bourgeois society that obsesses with form and order simply mirrors the contradiction between boundless sub subjectivity and the finitude of objective reality, a dilemma that governs every aspect of Werther's life. Werther's suicide is a triumph. Um, Werther's suicide condemns a world that, with all its limitation, cannot prove itself worthy of a truly divine life. Korf's interpretation turns Werther into a text that its early critics feared it might actually be, an apology of suicide. Completed at the, um, after the First World War, this tenatological interpretation is certainly rooted in the spirit of the times. Let's not forget that Sigmund Freud, um, until that point, the philosopher that knew, that, that allowed nothing um, to be secondary to the pleasure principle, um, the same Freud actually introduced the death drive as the second driving principle that drives human actions. But it would be a mis I, I don't think it's a, a mistake to consider Korf, Korf's interpretation. Um, um, I don't think that um, Korf's interpretation is just an idiosyncrasy. In fact, the Chinese and Japanese reception of the time shows a very similar trajectory. And here I come to the next quotes. This is um, from the preface of Guo Moro's translation of 1922. Um, here I, I showed this cover because in the middle it is not too clear here we have a Prometheus. So Werther and Prometheus are already the paradigm, a paradigmatic brothers in spirit here in this um, Chinese version. I quote, so it, it, um, I, I should explain that Guomoro at that time was already a quite celebrated poet. Um, he wrote very boisterous, very exuberant uh, poetry, was criticized for the linguistic liberties that he took, and then, um, and then um, translated Werther and added a very programmatic um, preface that addresses all the aspects that interest um, him in Werther. I quote, the ultimate aim of man only lies in the quest for the eternal joy and that is all. In the search for this eternal joy we must forget about our egos and in order to forget the ego Goethe does not seek silence but movement. 
approaching the smallest thing with the greatest care, he employs his body and soul to seize the essence of every moment to expand his ego. Using one's entire soul to admiring everything. After making Lotte's acquaintance, Werther says, and since that time sun, moon and stars may pursue their course, I know not whether it is day or light, the whole world about me has, about me has ceased to be. Loving with one's entire soul like this, being intoxicated with one's entire soul, worrying with one's entire soul, griefing with one's entire soul, everything to the utmost, everything to the end. That is the reason behind his, Bertha's extreme pity for the madman and his acceptance of suicide, which he does not regard as a sinful action. Instead, he goes as far as praising it. And this is my favorite part of this quote. Committing suicide of the ego is actually the highest virtue, the exact opposite of the moral values as spread by the lukewarm doctrine of the mean. Before I had come across um, Koff's interpretation, I thought that Waugh's essay was completely out of tune with anything put forward by Goethe scholarship. Here, Werther's unhinged personality serves as a guide into a new age of liberation. Guomoro forms part of a literary movement that sought to overthrow Chinese traditional thought. For this aim, to this aim, he emulated Western models and to advance his vision of art for art's sake and social freedom. Guo found in Werther a congenial reference for a new life that is saturated with a worldview that promises constant pantheist ecstasy. Evidently, this interpretation departs significantly from accepted ideas on Werther, especially um, in German language material, where Werther is, as I argued, um, a pathological character through and through. War takes liberties also, because he supposes that Werther praises suicide as the highest virtue. In fact, Werther never makes such a comment, he only justifies suicide in extreme cases when an individual um, is in a hopeless situation. But I wonder, does Guo take excessive liberties? Does he take more liberties than, say, Goethe scholars who only regard Werther through the lens of pathology? So after, after this passage, I would like to switch to a Japanese um, essay on Goethe's Werther um, that puts forward a very similar approach. Um, in 1937, um, the Japanese scholar Kamei Katsuichiro published the treatise Education of Mankind essay on Goethe. And now the quote reads, when we read Werther today, we are moved by his intense denial, his decisive rejection of reality from which he continuously seeks to escape and his heartfelt melancholy. Only the Sturm und Drang movement features such flight from reality, such escapism, including the final moment when the hero takes revenge on this reality. He encounters his own doom in the moment of death. Perhaps only young people, owing to their innocent, can grasp that the most beautiful moment in life, love, blossoms in the proximity of death. Werther finds the fulfillment of love in the pain he experiences after rejecting social conventions and seeking to, revenge, seeking re to take revenge on his environment. When true love appears on the horizon, you will die. Perhaps Werther finds his own truth by choosing to die. Once again, we encounter an affirmative reading of Werther's choice to die. It endows the protagonist with the dignity 
that conventional um, scholarship denies him. Confronted with such wayward interpretations, I could start to con contextualize. I could make the argument that Korf's reading was informed by the paradigms of the interwar period. I could inflect that War Moro contaminates Werther with his notion of French decadence and perhaps a couple of Taoistic ideas. I could also claim that Kame, writing in 1936, reflects the mood of the Pacific War. After all, Kame in the end became a Japanese nationalist. But for, no, for now, I would like to use these three interpretations only to underscore a simple point. That there, Werther is not simply an example for a piece of writing that is taken out of context, but that Werther indeed offers different entrances to different audiences. This Werther is certainly not compatible with the requirements of secondary school, but it evokes the dark romanticism that can be traced to early literary adaptations of Werther. Um, and here I would like to refer back to um, six novels, um, first three European novels that actually um, emerge um, quite soon after the publication of Werther in, um, in other countries that are outside Germany. There's Senan Kur's Obermann, a largely forgotten text now, which is very Werthertarian Werther and um, very, very dark. Then um, Benjamin Constance Adolphe, um, not as dark as Obermann, but still pretty dark. And maybe I thought I should add Byron Manfred, but it is not entirely sure um, whether this is really dark or just humorous. Um, as the Far Eastern reception of Werther was really, um, had a backlog of 100 years, um, I would name here um, the following names as uh, following uh, novels as pieces of references for this dark, dark romanticism. Soseki's Kokoro, basically the first modern novel in, in, in Japan, then Guomoro's Trilogy of Wandering, and Daza is no longer, no longer human, a very perplexing text indeed that is often quoted um, by Japanese scholars to be very Vatarian. So in the monograph that I'm currently writing, I try to give a more detailed account of this um, death-driven nexus of Werther. Um, I realized that I'm running a bit late, so I might actually skip um, the passage on, the, on, on, on socialist readings. I just should add that there's this scene in Werther where the protagonist is kicked out from a from an aristocratic gathering, and um, in 1846 there was Karl Grün who said, "Like, yeah, this shows that Goethe was a proto-socialist um, activist um, who who um, whose feelings are with the working classes, etc." And then actually um, Friedrich Engels steps in and says, "Like, no, this." nothing revolutionary about Werther, because Werther is basically a, a sissy. He actually uses the term sissy in that sense. And then, but um, after this verdict from Engels in 1936, George Lukacs, um, who soon will have his um, 50th um, death anniversary, um, presented a uh, Werther interpretation that um, figures out how Werther is actually a revolutionary text. Um, but in order not to overspill and to strain your um, patience, um, I will skip this. So I made this, this is very sad because I made this beautiful um, collage where um, Lukacs, who we have here in the right bottom corner, thinks up um, Werther, the de his dead body, um, being diagnosed by in Marxian terms. Um, and then we've got Foscolo, who actually applies a very re revolutionary discourse to the, um, to the Werther, um, Werterian novel. And this is mirrored in um, Chinese text. So here I will stop my presentation and... Um,
talk about the rest um, um, not aided by PowerPoint. Here I would like to return to my original question. What do different strands of interpretations have to do with Goethe's Werte? It is one thing to argue that they are all equally valid and another thing to understand the driving forces between such different interpretations. In a way, this question leads to one of the most fundamental questions of cultural criticism. What is the purpose of cultural goods? Are they just Christmas trees that we decorate with our own ornaments? In this light, the differences between Goethe's own interpretation, Korff's interpretation or Lukács' um, interpretation would boil down to individual preferences. Some people like to decorate their Christmas tree with candles, others prefer electrical um, light chains. And I'm sure there's even people who like to have both. I am aware that scholarship has moved on from the idea that texts can only hold one particular meaning. So Roland Barthes advanced the idea of plural signification of literary texts and Jacques Derrida posited that texts can be grafted onto other texts without losing their readability. Barth argues that to interpret a text is not to give it a more or less justified, more or less free meaning, but on the contrary, contrary to appreciate what plural constitutes it. And Derrida elaborates, I quote, the sign can always be detached from a chain in which it is inserted or given without causing it to lose all poss possibility of functioning. I fully agree. And yet it does, this, this does not really help us account for the literary preconditions that govern the production of literary um, semantic pl plurality. To understand the situation of Werte, where multiple interpretations are possible at the same time, I found a satisfying account in the philosophy of perception. Here the possibility of double validity has met its most original analysis in Ludwig Wittgenstein's commentaries on bistable perception. Famously, he meditated on the rabbit duck, a schematic drawing um, a schematic drawing that he regards as representative uh, for ambiguity at large. So here um, you can see um, the one and the same image being a duck in one case, if this is the eye and this is the beak of the duck, um, or it's actually a rabbit. So it can be both, um, it's one drawing that can, and can have two significations. The image shows a one-eyed head with two extensions protruding that allows viewers to alternate, to alternatingly interpret them as rabbit ears or as the duck beak. The rabbit ears or as the duck, duck beak. Since the simultaneous perception of both images is impossible, only one aspect flashes up at the time. So you can't see them both at the same time. You need to to have the aspect flashing up, and then you see the rabbit, and then you see the asp uh, aspect flashing up, and um, then you see the, um, the duck. In Wittgenstein's thought, the solution to this problem is not to accept only one aspect and to reject the other, but in the realization that perception is an interpretation, is an act of interpretation itself. We do not see but interpret sensory input. So can we apply this example to Werther? Texts are comprised by series of scenes. When we interpret the text, we usually pick a key scene and use it as a prism that informs the rest of the story. Early on, I followed this procedure by quoting the specific scene of Werther being in nature and having this dark notion um, of the creation, nature's destructive power. And then in the other Marxian reading, the central scene is Werther's ejection from court. 
the tacit assumption is that other scenes do not matter as much. In theory, the reader can um, pick any scene from the entire text and advance his own interpretation based on this scene. In fact, I'm currently trying to reconstruct the masochist nexus in Werther. And at the moment, if you'd ask me what is Werther about, I, I would say Werther wants to um, enter a slave contract with Lotte, but commit suicide because she refuses. But of course, I'm exaggerating a bit here. Earlier on, I said that poetry and truth, Goethe's autobiography, helped bury Werther under the weight of Goethe's narrative of self-conquest and renunciation. In this light, Korf, Cuomoro, and Kamei Katsuichiro allow us to access the term, uh, the text from a different angle. Werther does not simply commit suicide, but maintains his own dignity by doing this. As soon as we become comfortable with this new aspect, um, we can turn to the Marxist interpretation. Here, Werther functions as a lightning rod of the social upheavals of the 19th and 20th century. In a way, as readers, we are in a similar situation to that of Werther. In fact, Werther himself is a proponent of mighty stability. He refuses to settle for one aspect in an observation act when an observation actually needs um, to, um, to be taken care of by choosing one option of two. Soon after meeting Lotte for the first time, Wilhelm, the, um, the letter correspondent of Werther, urges Werther to make a decision. He should either find a way to woo Lotte, to pursue her seriously, or he should simply give her up. But Werther is irritated or even gets angry at this proposition. And he retorts, I quote, Only remember one thing. In this world, it is seldom a question of either or. There are as many shadings of conduct and opinion as there are turns of feature between an aquiline nose and a flat one. Thus, you mustn't think ill of me if I concede your entire argument and still, contr still contrive to find a way somewhere between either and or. I hear you say either you have hopes of obtaining Lotte um, or you have none. Well, in the one case, pursue your course and press on to the fulfillment of your wishes. In the other, be a man and try to get rid of a miserable passion that will enervate and destroy you. My dear friend, this is all well said and easily said." End of quote. Wilhelm's well-intentioned recommendation is that Werther should make a choice between two options, but he refuses. Werther's argument appears defensive at first. Perhaps he doesn't really want to test Lotte's love, um, nor does he want to exert self-control as the other option requires. At the same time, Werther also addresses a question of formal logics that deserves attention with regard to our problem here. The either or option is known as an alternation, but Werther interprets it as a gradual distinction. This is a very wild claim that doesn't quite conform to any ideas of logics. But the closest um, equivalent um, of his proposition is the idea that either or is not an alternation, but a conjunction. Hereby, um, he would suggest that depending on the viewpoint, both operands can be true. He does have hopes and he does not. Depending on circumstances, Lotte's gestures can be interpreted as affection or disinterest. Only one aspect flashes up at a time. To embrace by stability does not make life easier. This is what Werther shows, um, quite the contrary. In fact, the acknowledgement of by stability drives Werther into suicide in the end. 
But I don't think that as readers, we are running the same risk. As readers, we can, can learn to live with bi-stability. This brings me back to the initial point about appropriation. Is it legitimate to ignore Goethe's self-interpretation and advance alternative interpretations? Yes, of course. And yet, habit has made us unresponsive to the semantic plural that is hidden in Werther. We are still, in a way, afraid of misunderstanding. Is it also legitimate when Guo Woro or Kamei Katsuichiro appropriate a German classic quite recklessly? I would argue that it is not only legitimate, but necessary in order to keep such texts alive. In recent years, François Julien, the French sinologist and philosopher, has argued that cultural goods should not be understood as solid entities. They should not only be inhabited by those who, who identify with them. Instead, he proposes to regard cultural goods as resources. These resources must be cultivated and constantly reinvested. The reception history of Werther demonstrates that this novel was appropriated and reinvested time and again. The novel managed to fulfill readerly needs in ways that could have not been um, anticipated. Werther, the hero of self-sacrifice, Werther, a figure of almost Wagnerian proportion, or Werther, the petty aristocrat who transcends his own privileges. At the moment, however, I feel that Werther is going through a rough patch. Nobody really cares to reread the book and reinvest it. But this may change in the near future. As it appears, we should not expect powerful readings to emerge in the German-speaking Rahm or even in Europe, perhaps not even on Earth itself. Perhaps you remember the pioneer plaque. A, this is the pioneer plaque, um, a piece of information that was sent out with an Apollo mission in the 1970s. The idea was that if an alien civilization intercepts, intercepts this um, plaque, they have the basic information about humanity. So here we've got, um, actually my printer cut this off. We have the position of Earth within the solar system. Um, we've got the size of the Apollo, um, um, the, 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 the Apollo, it's not a ship, but a, a satellite um, in relation to uh, the human. And we've got one ma male and one female. I would like to amend this image. Um, and I would like to um, reinterpret, re, re, reshuffle um, the guy here as a Werther with letters that he wrote and a gun. And Lotte should, how, should have pink ribbons so that, that he, she can be identified as the fetishistic object. And maybe I would add Albert here on the edge as well as the third one who spoils the party. And actually, with this image, everything would be said. The alien civilization would have the kernel of the idea of Werther, and maybe, with some time delay, send back their interpretation of the text. I cannot wait for it. So this is the end of my text, um, of my lecture. Thank you. <laughs>